This is Crystals 101 with the Urban Conservatory Discord server. This is lesson number four about identifying your stones and crystals. Fun stuff. I'm going to share my screen and show you my presentation here in a second. As soon as it... Oh, I'm sharing my screen. Don't... I gotta be careful which tab I show you because you might wind up seeing... Uh, Pardon me. You might wind up seeing Reiki wands that aren't wands. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about identifying crystals because it's cool. <laughs> Why do we care about identifying the crystals in our collections? Um, on one level, it doesn't matter. If you have a good energetic vibe with your stones, you can go with a purely intuitive approach to using rock stones and crystals, gems and minerals in your whatever you're using them for. Like if you just think it's pretty and you're like, but it matches my outfit. Okay, cool. There's zilch wrong with that. That approach? Go for it. Yes, please. Oh, I should probably tag the class and let people know. Hey, we started. Class has begun and you've already missed out. <laughs> People are going to panic over that. I'm such a pain. I'm so bad. I'm so mean. I'd feel bad about that, but I don't. So if you want to just wear, you know, uh, the, the picture in this particular slide, which um, if you're in the class, uh, the first pin has the dock the written material and this presentation so that you can follow along or go over it on your, at your own time. But uh, the picture in this slide this is slide number two. Um, that's some of my collection. <clears throat> I might be a magpie. And if you decide you're like, I just want to wear it because it's pretty and I like the color. Okay, cool. If you decide that this stone has this energy and every single book you ever read disagrees with you, I mean, maybe the books are wrong for you. Go for it. But in general, we care because what the stone is impacts how much it costs when we buy it. Because we do live within, unfortunately, a capitalist society in which value is assigned to all sorts of goods, including pretty, pretty rocks. So knowing what it is and how rare it is and how it's cut, and how it is, like what it looks like, how good it is, how highly valued it is, can um, affect how much you're going to pay for it. Pardon me. Hey, doggies, you can't both sit in the same spot. That was the Shih Tzu growling. Sorry about that. When it comes to red, pretty, pretty red rocks, rubies, garnets, and red spinels um, all have an association with Mars and fire because they're red. And let's face it, sometimes our ancestors were a little bit simplistic, but that's okay. We love them anyway. But rubies, garnets, and spinels vary in cost. And in, depending on your source and how good the thing is, you might be able to find a garnet that costs more than a ruby. Size matters a whole lot. Also, garnets, rubies, and spinels all have very slightly different energies. They, they're just a little bit different. Just because they're all red and they all have an association with fire and they all have an association with Mars, doesn't mean that that's the whole story. You want to know what the stone is, so you know what it can do, what it does for you, how it works, how it vibes, how it feels. In this picture, I want you to pay attention. Um, I didn't make a slide specifically talking about it, but when it comes to gemstones and crystals that are made into jewelry, in particular, we're looking at things like the color of the stone, 
the cut of it, how, how it's cut, how it's shaped, how big it is, that's the carrot size, and whether it has inclusions, and that's how cloudy it looks. You can see the orange stone in that picture is very, very clear. And the little red stone that's right next to it, you can't see through it. It's got a lot of inclusions in it. The red stone costs more than the orange stone because the red is a ruby in a cabochon cut. The orange is a sapphire. It's a Padparasha sapphire in particular. That Padparasha and the purple pendant next to it cost about the same. The purple thing, that's an amethyst. Brilliant cut. So is the Pad Parasha, by the way. An orange, um, the oval, brilliant cut. All of those things affect the cost and affect the price of it. And the depth of the color matters a whole lot, too. There are, in fact, three rubies in that picture. The ring, the pendant, and the loose stone. Uh, and you can see that the ring is a little bit pinker. The pendant has a deeper red tone to it more purpley red and the loose stone in the center is just mainly red all of those factors have impact on how much those particular chunks of rock cost when we're talking about rocks we can split things into categories precious and semi-precious and silicon oxide and not silicon oxide the precious stones are called this because, in general, they are more expensive. They're valued higher. And we call them precious, and that gives us a snobby, happy, little materialistic feeling deep down in our souls. Everything that's not precious is semi-precious. The precious stones are diamond, ruby, emerald, and sapphire. Blue sapphire, let's be clear. Semi-precious stones would be Everything else, literally everything else falls under semi-precious. Amber, pearls, topaz, amethyst, citrine, peridot, all of those semi-precious. Despite the fact that some examples of those semi-precious stones I just listed can be really expensive. Like, yikes. Because they're rare, they're hard to get a hold of. A rose quartz with good clarity? <laughs> Unheard of, for one thing. <laughs> Not going to happen. Um, but more clear than um, cloudy looking with good deep purpley pink color? Mm, that's expensive. That is, that is a spendy thing. So silicon, silicon oxide... It's quartz. All of the quartz minerals. Yes, in the chat, uh, Carrie says, I love semi-precious stones. So many of them are so pretty. They really are. They are gorgeous, and I love them. The vast majority of my rock collection is semi-precious, because hollow. I'm in love with them. Quartz and agate, it's the second most common mineral on the face of the planet, coming in after feldspar, which is the number one most, by volume, most of the planet Earth is made of feldspar. It's everywhere. So, um, quartz and agate, and then everything else. There's a whole lot that falls under everything else. But there is a reason the word crystal, remember from lesson number one, crystal was crystallos from the Greek for ice. Quartz is actually very, very common. Incredibly common. That's why it got picked up as being the uh, exemplar for what a crystal is. Let us begin our adventure into identifying rocks by talking about corundum. I love a good corundum. 
Mm, corundum is so pretty. It is aluminum oxide. It will have different um, minerals associated with it and different ores associated with it that lend it different colors. Corundum occurs in every color of the rainbow. All of them. This picture, those are all corundums. You see a white one with black flecks. The black flecks would be inclusions. You see a greenish looking one, a yellow one, a red one, and kind of a purpley with orange speckles looking corundum. Rubies are corundum. Sapphires are corundum. If it's a red, purpley red, or pinkish red, it's called a ruby. Every other color, it's a sapphire. If it's blue, it's a blue sapphire. Some of the other colors of corundum have different names. It depends on the color and also where it came from. So that orange stone in the first picture, right? That's a Padparacha sapphire. It comes from India. Uh, they're common there. Uh, that's what you need to know about that. <laughs> Corundum will have similar vibrations and feels across all the examples of a corundum, whether it's a padparacha, a sapphire, or a ruby, or a clear corundum, or a green corundum. They all have same basic energy, but it's flavored by what exactly it is. Rubies, um were found in the breastplate of the high priest of high of Aaron. Thanks. They're one of the, you know, they're ancient. Um, Romans used them as protective amulets because uh, the corundum ruby crystals, they come out kind of tetrahedral and occasionally very flat looking. And so you could take a raw ruby crystal and etch with a diamond, entertainingly enough, etch it with a diamond to put in a, um, a sigil on the surface of the corundum uh, and carry it as a protective amulet. Corundum has a hardness of 9.5, sorry, 9, 9, not 9.5, moissanite has 9.5. Corundum is a hardness of 9, which means only moissanite or diamond can etch it out of the natural stones. Sapphire helps with the clarity of thought. It can purify mental blocks. Both ruby sapphire, padparacha sapphire, clear corundum, green corundum, all the rainbow of colors of corundum, um, have a strong tendency to pierce through blockages. And to um, uh, the, the way that ruby helps, uh, aids in protection, stimulates physical energy and health. The way it does that is by being very pokey. It's very forward and, and, and forceful in its energy. If you carry ruby for help with physical energy and health, pay attention to yourself. You may find yourself becoming overstimulated because ruby is noisy. I'm currently wearing my ruby pendant and I feel good. I knew that I would, but I'm wearing ruby, so... Hmm. Sapphire helps with um, mental blocks by, again, being very forward, rather forceful, and pushing through. So ruby pushes physically, sapphire pushes mentally. Um, Hadbaraja sapphire, by the way, the orange one, pushes uh, through the area of, of wants and needs and desires. Barrels. I love a good barrel. It's one of my favorite stones. Barrel, isn't it beautiful? Beryllium aluminum cyclosilicate with inclusions, of course, that turn it different colors. Emeralds are barrels. So is aquamarine, which tells you that our division between what is a precious stone and what's a semi-precious stone is, um, arbitrary. Speaking of, let me back up just briefly and tell you about rubies. Within the subset of stones known as rubies, 
Various red crystals have been misidentified as ruby over the ages. For instance, spinal. Spinal, a red spinal, has been identified as ruby forever. Because until we had, um, it's a laser, uh, laser diffraction, refraction um, system. You shine a light through it and, and then you interpret the crystalline refractions that come out to tell you what the exact crystalline structure of the stone is and exactly what it is. Before we had that technology, basically people looked at it and went, well, that's really pretty and a nice red. Must be a ruby. So the Black Prince's ruby in the crown jewels of England, that thing, it's not a ruby. It's a spinal other stones that have been misidentified as ruby would be garnets, <laughs> garnets, red spinals, and actual rubies have all been called rubies over the years. Also, for a little while there in the Middle Ages, there was a fad for taking um, uh, like red spinals and treating them to make the red more intense so that you could sell it for even more and tell people it was a ruby faking stones and taking stones that you know aren't a ruby and making it look more like a ruby. Mm. It's been done for ages. This is why you need to know what that is before you buy it. Please and think. So barrels, emeralds, aquamarine, morganite. It also comes in other colors, but those are the three major colors it comes in. It's barrel. Aquamarine uh, and emerald are both birthstones. Emerald for um, March? Is it March? I used to have this memorized. An aquamarine... April, I think. I might be making that up. Look it up, because I'm not at all certain about that. I, I used to have that memorized when I worked in the jewelry store because people would come and be like, I need a stone. I just gave birth to my son. And I'd be like, oh, well, then in that case, I know exactly what rock to sell you. Neither aquamarine nor emerald should ever be cleaned by a person working in a jewelry store unless they tell you, oh, I'm not going to put this in the ultrasonic jewelry cleaner because the barrel is fragile. Fragile. Don't drop it. For the love of God, don't drop it. In the image here, you see the silvery stuff that's piled up around the base of these three rocks. That would be um, in order Morganite, Aquamarine, and Emerald. Um, that stuff's called Museum Buddy, and they're using that to hold those stones in place so they don't go rolling around. So the Golden Barrel, or Morganite, protects against outside influences, where emerald aids relationships and true love and protects you when you're traveling. Aquamarine shields the aura and protects sea travelers. Oh, sorry. Golden Barrel does outside influences, and Morganite attracts love and releases karmic emotional pain. All barrels work for protection. Whether that protection is aimed at the harms you cause yourself, so emotional karmic pain, um, protecting sea travelers, that's mostly because it looks like the ocean, um, protecting travelers, protecting sea travelers. You see, there's a, there's, an, there's a theme in what these stones do. They protect you when you wander around in the world. Also, they're pretty. It's hard to tell in these pictures, but emerald and aquamarine um the reason those stones so the emerald in this picture has a little bit more defined crystalline structure and so does the morganite except at the tip where you can see it's worn away quite a bit the tips of all of these are worn and chipped looking that aquamarine looks like it's been put through a rock tumbler halfway it's because those stones are really fragile if you did put those into a rock tumbler <laughs> Please don't. You're going to get dust back out. <laughs> they would not survive the trip. And it's not because beryllium aluminum cyclosilicate in and of itself isn't a hard mineral. It is. It just forms in kind of flakes. The reason why emeralds... Um, oh, and 
both corundum, by the way, and barrels can be grown in a lab easily. We started growing corundums in the mid 1800s, and we've been growing barrels just about as long as we've been growing um, corundums. So we can grow these in a lab. You will know if you get a lab grown emerald versus a natural emerald. A natural emerald will always look cloudy. Every single natural emerald is cloudy. They all have inclusions. That's how you know they're real. It's part of how that crystal grew, how it formed in the world. Lab grown barrels are perfectly pure and therefore clear. You get a really pretty bright green rock with nothing inside of it. It's lab grown. The lesson after this, we're going to go really in depth, crazy in depth on quartz. <laughs> because it is the second most common mineral on the face of the planet. And it makes up so many, so many rocks. It absorbs, stores, releases and regulates energy. That's what it does. It is piezo, piezoelectric, which means that under pressure, or if you strike it or rub it or bang it on something, it will emit an electric charge. It gives a little spark. It's incredibly common, but we value it because it has so many industrial applications. Um, if you have a watch, for example, that has um, quartz movement, they're literally using the fact that every time it... Um, as, as it's ticked on, it emits electricity. So you wind up your watch, it's got a little spring in there that starts the whole thing going, and it's regulated by the presence of a quartz crystal in there, in the piezo piezoelectric um, effect that it's doing. Quartz varieties. Herkimer diamond, rock crystal, amethyst, citrine, ametrine, rose quartz, chalcedony, carnelian, adventurine, agate, onyx, jasper, milky quartz, smoky quartz, tiger's eye, praseolite, rutilated quartz, dometorite, sard, helotripe, morganite, cristobalite, and that's not all. There's more. We're going to go over all of those. <laughs> Probably with like one or two words, because there's a bunch and that's only about half of the different varieties of quartz that you can find for sale in various rock and crystal um, stores. Quartz is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And that's not even touching on the fact that we know how to change quartz an enhanced stone or a stone that's been heat treated in order to change the color of it. So yes, we will also talk about the aura quartzes. Titanium aura, gold aura, silver aura quartzes. Because they're fun. And they're pretty. They're just so, they're just so pretty. We will also go into as many of the types of agate as I can before my brain falls out and runs away and hides under the couch. The main thing you need to know about quartz, irregardless of what kind it is, all quartz does the same things. Absorbs, stores, releases, and regulates energy. It's just while it's absorbing it, storing it, and releasing it, it's regulating it. And every different variety of quartz adds its own special je ne sais quoi to what's going on in there. Rose quartz tends to slant things towards love, self-love, acceptance, and compassion. Where ametrine, which is a mix of amethyst and citrine, has a tendency to elevate your mind, um, uh, your mental outlook, and provide you with perspective from an, an elevated um, karmic perspective on, on things. So they're still absorbing, storing, releasing, and regulating the energy. They're just doing it a little bit differently. So let's say you've got a whole bunch of rocks and you're like, I don't know what these are. How do you figure out what they are? 
if it's in a piece of jewelry. First, what metal is it in? Every, so I'm, I'm in the United States, this is from the perspective of the US, and the United States gem and crystal market has a huge influence on the international gem and crystal market. So look, somewhere on your piece of jewelry, there is a tiny, tiny little bitty stamp that will tell you what the metal is, whether it's gold or silver. If it's silver, it will say sterling or 925, which is um, 0.925 percent or yeah, 92.5 percent pure silver. There's nickel in it to make it a little stronger. Um, if it says 10K, uh, 10 karat gold, 14K, 18K, um, 24K, uh, you'll, you're more likely to find 18 and 24 karat or 22 karat gold internationally rather than in the United States because um, pure gold is more prized in international markets than in American markets. In America, the most common carats of gold you're going to find are 10 and 14. 10 often used for necklaces and for chains because uh, the less pure gold it is, the um, more sturdy <laughs> the piece of jewelry is. Um, a 24 karat gold ring, you have a, it, it needs to be fairly thick and really bulky because if you bang it on something, you can crack it. It's gold is prized because it's a very soft mineral. It's really soft metal. So check to see what's it set in. We set diamonds in gold. If it's a diamond set in silver, it's probably not a very good diamond. We don't set really big, pretty, shiny, flashy diamonds in silver. We set them in gold. And if we want it to look like it's silver, it's plated with either platinum or rhodium. But it'll still have the mark on it indicating what the base gold, what the base metal underneath the coating is. So if you've got a really big, shiny, clear stone, and it's in silver, it's not a diamond. 99% of the time, that's not a diamond. Otherwise, look at the color. Use Google. Nine, nine times out of ten, unless I look at a rock that somebody in the uh, Discord channel has said, what's this? And if I, if I don't look at it and go, oh, I know exactly what that is, boom, it's a blue. You know, it's a whatever. Um, I look it up online. I use Google. And if that doesn't work, I use one of my rock books to kind of narrow it down. Rock books, uh, the National Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Gems, Crystals, and Minerals, is arranged by color. Look it up by the color first, and then examine it. How transparent is it? How much light shines through it? Hold it up to a light source kit. Can you see through it? And to what degree does light pass through it? That's going to tell you a whole lot about what this is. Because if it's clear or you can see through it, it's probably quartz. Probably quartz. Honestly. <laughs> Nine times out of ten. You got your quartz there, buddy. You're also going to look at the crystal structure. It does look like malachite. It's not. Um, Alex says the one labeled as adventuring looks like malachite. Um, this picture does not have a malachite in it. Um, you would have to zoom in on that image really, really tight, but you'd be able to see gold flecks in it. Adventuring comes in multiple green tones. Hey, Valencia shared a picture of the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Rocks and Minerals. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I've read it. <laughs> so you're going to look at um, color, the transparency, and the crystal structure. It's easier to tell aventurine from malachite apart when you've got it in front of you. Look at it really, really up close. Aventurine will look like um, it's sparkly because it's a quartz. It's got the crystalline structure inside of it that leads it to sparkle. It also has little gold flecks within it that give it an extra bit of shine. Whereas malachite is non-crystalline. It's grossular. 
which um, think of grossular and remember the word grapes. Grapes are grossular. They're rounded and it forms in rounded lumps, clumps, and grossular formations. So when you cut malachite, you see the internal structure where it formed and built up over years upon years of depositing that copper ore in place. So it has bands in it, different um, shades of green in stripes across um, malachite. You're also going to look at the cleavage. When we say cleavage, when it comes to rocks, we're not talking about its decolletage. We're talking about how does it crack? How does it break? I'm not saying you should break your rocks. Geologists break rocks to find out how it cleaves. You probably don't want to do that. And I'm not saying that you should. But look to see, is there a chip? Are there obvious fracture patterns on here? Has it already come broken? Crystals, when they break, they break along crystal growth patterns. And they break in the shape of the crystal. So if you took a fluorite and you broke it, it would break in the shape of a tetrahedron. If you take a ruby and you break it, good luck, they're very hard. But if you could manage to break a ruby and crack it, it would break in the shape of the um, aluminum silica oxide, whatever it was, the corundum shape. So sometimes um, broken bits on your stone can tell you a whole lot. If you look at malachite, a broken piece of malachite will crack and fracture along the, the lines of um, the, the layers, the bands. It'll crack along a band before it cracks through the band. Agates have, um, when they break, it, they kind of, they break off in um, concave chunks. They're like smooth little bowls because they're amorphous and they tend to break and cleave or fracture in um, smooth curves, smooth curving shapes, basically. Whereas a more crystalline agate or a crystalline quartz um, fractures along the crystal plane. So it's more sharp and straight, straight lines, sharp edges. Whereas an agate it's smooth. It's curvy. You're also going to look at the luster of a stone. It's how it reflects light on the surface. In this image, look at that blue howlite. Right? Um, third row down, second from the left. That's a blue howlite. It's, been, it's a white stone that's been dyed blue to mimic turquoise. But part of why they use howlite to mimic turquoise is because its surface luster comes fairly close to the surface luster of turquoise. Turquoise has a very, um, it doesn't reflect a whole lot of light. It's not extra shiny, and it tends to be rather matte. Compare the, the way the light is shining on that halite to the hematite right next to it, where we've got good light, lots of reflection. You can see a, like a, almost a lens flare on it, or the light, uh, the reflection on the obsidian on the far right side. The luster tells you a lot about what stone is this. Whether it's shiny, whether it looks like it's a little bit greasy almost. Calcite will not be shiny. Calcite will always look like it's vaguely greasy. And that's part of what made me, um, Kia Lani uh, posted a picture earlier asking, what is this? Is it quartz or marble? And I said, that's calcite. Uh, and it's because of the way the light is shining on it. I can see that the light is hitting the desk it's sitting on pretty well. Like there's a fair amount of reflection and reflected light on there. But the way that it's shining on that ball, it's not super reflective. Calcite. So that's what you look for when you're trying to identify your stones. By color, degree of transparency, the crystal structure or lack thereof. Um, the second row from the bottom, third from the right, that is tourmalated quartz. You can see it. It's a tumbled stone that's white quartz with black tourmaline inside it. 
So when I say look at the crystal structure, that, that's what I'm talking about. The prehenite, third from the left on the same row, you can see crystal structure in that picture, in that image. The unakite, the variskite, the zoisite, you can see those, those are crystalline structures. All of those are examples of, of the structure that I'm talking about. The blue agate, um, upper left corner, that would be a blue lace agate or blue lace agate, a chalcedony or saffron. But that's, that's what that is. And looking at it, the crystalline structure of that stone, that blue with that kind of white lacy looking crystalline structure in it, blue lace agate, that's what it is. So by color, by transparency, by crystal structure, any broken bits on it, and how does it reflect the light? Lapis lazuli also um, is not super duper shiny. Okay, so the exercise. The written material has the exercise laid out a little bit more, and I also, I can't remember if I put it in the Google Classroom already. I might have, I might not have. <laughs> Hello, briefly. Um, if you need help identifying your stones, the best possible way, A plus, best possible way, please, if you take a picture of it, take it in sunlight, good, strong, bright sunlight. Indoor lighting often tints things kind of yellowy, and it's harder to see the true color. And remember that color is the first thing you look at when you're trying to identify a stone. If you, if you can see the real color of it, you can get closer to what is that? So if you need help, take a picture as close to the stone as you possibly can to show the structure of the crystals in it. As in focus and clear in good, bright, outdoor sunlight, please. For your exercise, you've identified your rocks you examined how you're keeping your current set of rocks. For this one, I want you to take one of your minerals, gems, or crystals that you don't know what it is, and I want you to try to identify it. And, you know, feel free to go pick something up out of the parking lot. Identify that. Um, if you know what all of your rocks are, take one that you're certain you've identified and meditate with it or otherwise try to figure out what its energy is. Identify the vibe of that rock for you. And then if you're really motivated, look it up. Look it up online. Look it up in various rock books. There's a bunch in the uh, library for the server. And see, were you right? I'm, I'm not grading for whether or not you were right. <laughs> No, <laughs> I'm grading for, did you do it? Have you taken the time to connect with a rock energetically, to figure out, to touch it, to rub all over it, to work with it, to say, what, what are you? How do you work? What's your thing? Um, I'm not sure if the National, the, the Audubon Society Field Guide to North American Rocks and Minerals is in the server or not. I don't know. It's it's not a small book. It's not little. But it'd be cool if it was. As always, I have resources. Um, the first three, those are books that I used when I was pulling out information about what um, the various corundums barrels um, are for. Uh, Melody's Love is in the Earth. Good luck getting a hold of that book. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get. Um, Cutting Hams, Encyclopedia of Crystal Gem and Metal Magic. That one is in the library. And Judy Hall's Encyclopedia of Crystals. I also relied on Wikipedia for information on the chemical structure, cleavage patterns, um, prevalence, uh, stuff like that. For a corundum barrel and quartz. Yeah. <laughs> Valencia says, oh yeah, it's 800 pages, but it's fascinating because it includes all the information about how these stones grew, where they came from. Um, crystal structure is covered in there, like all of it, all of it. It's so cool. 
It's fascinating. Fascinating reading. I kind of breezed through this one today, but 